Hey there, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, through the, the wire today for uh, this kind of global seminar that we're doing as a result of us all being shut in. And uh, this is our quarantine series number two. And I am very excited to be interviewing Ivana Belikova, who many of you know as Ivana Tattoo Art. Uh, she has very iconic, bold, unique and original style. And I've seen, she's posted plenty of pictures of really nice healed photos of this stuff. And it, it's just, it's a great tattoo on top of being bright and iconic and very different. Because Ivana's work is so different, uh, my first thought was, oh, she must have had a background in watercolor painting or something, or, you know, had some kind of artistic background where she felt the style and uh, arrived at this unique thing and brought that into tattooing. But as it turns out, she developed this style well tattooing, uh, which is, I mean, you've been at it since you were, what, 16, 17 years old, you said? I started it since I was 18 years old. And yes, yeah, so that's that's been your primary, really only art form your whole life. And yet you went in this direction that's very different from traditional tattooing. And uh, so I guess my first question would be, uh, did you have to face resistance to this? Or was this something that clients seemed to want and you just ran with it? I think it was something uh, what I wanted to create on people. So I, I was doing free tattoos in earlier beginning of my career, but that was also because I wanted to be the best for myself. And I was exploring styles and everything. So I give away few free tattoos and uh, more and more people started to see my work. And that's pretty much how I started to work in my style. So it was almost like I forced it on people. Well, you <laughs> heavily encouraged it. I mean, you didn't duct tape them to the chair or anything. Yeah. And I'm sure that you probably found that when you got a chance to do a few really nice finished examples that it started to pick up its own momentum. Um, what else did you do at the time to help encourage this besides giving away a, a few free tattoos? Uh, this is something a lot of people ask. I've got this unique style I want to tattoo on people, but they're just asking me for regular old stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you still, I mean, you're going to be giving away some free tattoos, but you still have to do some tattoos that people want uh, to pay you for. Uh, and it's very difficult. People have found to push their style on people. Uh, how could you convince people not just to, it's a free tattoo, but uh, that what you're doing, this different look, is uh, something that they, they want to explore? So your, your question is how I'm pretty much uh, introduced this to my clients, to people? Yes. To, and, to, and they still pay for it? Yes, to create a market for a new look. Yes. Uh, basically, I, I think it was uh, going for me naturally. Like I said, I was giving away a few free tattoos and then more and more people want it. But I have to be a little bit stern at some point. So it wasn't about money for me. But basically, I was very picky with my work. Even up till today, I'm still very picky with my work, so I'm not taking every request. And if there's somebody really wanted to badly from me, I will take on it uh, with the condition that I have to do my stuff. So I, I just made it very clear in that sense. And you did that even in the beginning when you were just getting started? Yes, uh, not in the early of my career, because that time I was doing completely different, uh, different tattoos. You know, I was working lots of with the black ink only. I didn't even do color tattoos. But later on, when I was super clear and I kind of see like, yes, this is my style. This is exactly what I really enjoy. And this is something what I want to do. Then I was very specific about it. And, and still until today I am. I can make any kind of tattoos, but it's always going to be in my style. I'm not trying to do some traditional tattoos or something else because that is not entirely what I enjoy. You do a few different kinds of look within your style though. For example, you can even see on the wall behind you, occasionally you do portraits. Mm -hmm. And it's cool because it's still a good likeness. You know what I mean? It's not a realistic portrait. Yes. It's not like a photograph, but it's a recognizable portrait. Mm -hmm. But this is what I'm saying. So, yes, somebody wants a realistic tattoo from me. They bring me portrait of their whatever, let's say, family member. I will still do it in my style. 
So this is what I was referring to. As long as I can do it in my style, I will take on the tattoo. That's, yeah, definitely a good policy. So mm -hmm. let's go mm -hmm. ahead and, uh, Gabe, cue up that very first video, Tash. Uh, here we've got a video of, of doing what's, you know, a very typical larger work for you with lots of color saturation. And of course, when you've got somebody coming back for a leg sleeve, you can assume that you are going to be able to work every area as much as you need to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you work at conventions, though, and you're doing smaller pieces. Uh, how can you make sure that you can get your client back in the chair for that second session since it's so important to you? Yeah, so I, I'm very straightforward in beginning with my client. So I will explain him the process. I will explain my technique and why do I need more time or multiple sessions for a particular piece. And how many sessions it's going to be, I usually know in beginning depends on the size or placement. But the size is very important in this case. And even though necessarily I'm not coming though, let's say year after for the tattoo convention, I usually fly to the city. So let's say there was tattoo convention in New York and I'm not planning to come there anytime soon. Then I make sure I rebook my clients where I need to finish off my jobs and fly there anytime. So you're going to, so, you're going to leave enough pieces uh, that need work to make it worth a trip. Yes, usually. absolutely. Even though yes. if I book three clients, I will go because for me, it's very important to finish off my job. It's more important to me and matters to me more probably than for the people. And if my client decide they don't want to do two sessions or basically it's very difficult to fly somewhere or they don't want to wait, then it's okay. We established that in the beginning. And in that case, I just pass on appointment. I always want to make sure I do two passes, at least on the tattoo. Yeah, I mean, it, almost any style can benefit from that. I know with my own work, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. th that second pass, I can go deeper with the shadows. I can always make the outlines mm -hmm. look nicer, the, the colors Absolutely. I have a chance to fine tune. So yeah, very important. It's a game changer for me because I feel uh, the first pass, even though the tattoo looks, looks finished, my client thinks it's finished, but for me it's not, it kind of looks flat. When I go there again, then it's uh, really beautiful. It's more like a 3D, I would say. And it, it just looks more beautiful. I can add more detail into it. I can play with it a little bit more. So it's very important to me. And I really believe it's a game changer. I always take a photos before the first session and the second session, and you can see the difference. So I'm wondering if we uh, could see a few uh, stencils or uh, some of the early part of your process because you usually have mm -hmm. some kind of a reference that you're... Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'd love to see something. So, basically, uh, yes, I work out from the references. I do not draw anything beforehand. And uh, the reason behind it, I stopped doing that about 10 years ago, was because every, I, I love to work with the client's body, body part. And everybody has different shape and all of this. And then I felt when I draw something and I'm trying to transfer it on the body, it just doesn't hold. Not that it doesn't hold, but it doesn't... It doesn't have the correct flow, how I imagine to have it. So I do not draw anything be beforehand. Usually, like you, yeah, like you see, I do lots of portraits, whether it's animal, whether it's flowers or something. So I love to find my references on Google. I love to work from the, the actual photography, or in many cases, I will make my own photographs. So I used to go to botanical gardens, or I go outside, take some nice pictures of, let's say, roses, and I go from there. So. Then I print it out. I put it uh, for the Photoshop just to add a little bit more contrast and saturation because I need to see the I need to see the black parts of the tattoo. That's what's very important. And once I have the photo, so let's say this is this is the photo. You guys see yeah. it properly? Yeah, yes. I can see how you've drawn on it. Yes, exactly. And I just make a stencil on the other side. You know, so this is all what I need. It's basically, literally, I print it out and I make a stencil like this and that's it. When it comes to background or everything else, in many times I do freehand or I, again, like let's say this is another, let's say graphic stuff I use. I prepare some lines or I don't know. This is another, let's say, graphic I would use. And sometimes I prepare this beforehand. I have lots of these sketches at home, you know, or when I come to the studio, I prepare, let's say, five, ten of these stencils. So it's just fasten up my process. And then I'm just playing. I apply it into the tattoo or into the background. That's well, that, that, that is usually my process, how I, how I make all of my tattoos. That actually sounds sort of fun. Now, the, the dog mm -hmm. that you uh, were just showing us, it really 
shows how the photo was changed into your own language. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, if you don't mind showing us the stencil side of that again. Yes, and now, I want I want is... yes, I want I want to show you with this also. As you see, I'm focusing on shapes. So when I make a stencil, it's more it's more kind of for me the shape. You can see the squares a little bit here. See, it's kind of like all squares. Here is a square. Then I will blend it a little bit in. But the first session, this is this is what you're going to see. So it's kind of square, flat, and sketchy looking. And the second session, if I'm doing it again, it's going to look more 3D. So literally, it will be more blended. You can you can see, right? How I drew it? It's all shapes, yeah. kind of. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, that's it's cool because your mm -hmm. your look with your tattoo is with that large magnum square yes. brush stroke, and it seems like your yes. stencils are kind of set up to make that just mm -hmm. happen even more easily. Yeah, you see, basically, yes. Literally, I will take a brush and I just brushing it like straight brush here. This will be straight brush here. So I'm not trying to make it super realistic. It still has to be funky and playful enough for me, but literally, yes, I work with the, lots of with the magnums and I just drag the magnum. So it looks like a paint stroke or like, like a brush stroke. So speaking of brush strokes, uh, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about your uh, needle groups and things like that, because it definitely looks like you're using a large brush. Uh, what are mm -hmm. you using? So I'm using, uh, when it comes to company, I'm using everything from Cheyenne and I have multiple setup needles for one tattoo, even for the small pictures. I need all different fig, uh, needle configurations. So I'm using lots of round needles and magnums, but I like straight magnums for, for a simple reason, exactly because I want it to look like a paintbrush. So if I have a curved magnum, it's a little bit soft and, and I love the hard edges of my tattoos. Uh, usually my setup is three liner, five liner, nine liner, and then I have five, seven, nine, 13, 15, and 17 magnum. And so basically I'm using anything from six up to 10 needles for every, every tattoo I do. Okay. So the, the liner groups, do you, uh, ever use the round shaders with the needles spaced apart a little bit more? Or are you just like the liner configurations with the, the denser pack, uh, needles? Yes, completely the line of configurations. So it has to be a little bit tight for me, sharp. It's just for the sharp lines. Oh. Mm -hmm. Everything okay. else I'll do with magnums. Everything else, even though if I have sometimes thick line to do, I will take my favorite is uh, nine magnum or five magnum and I just drag it so the line is thick. Yes, I, I, now that's something I've seen in, in videos of you working is you're just mm -hmm. dragging those magnums along the skin mm -hmm. and um, you know, when I was taught to tattoo, there was this, you know, oval overlapping more, 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 more kind of thing where you're sort of, <laughs> and uh, it heals really great. I mean, these are very yeah. nice, smooth kind of. So is that a matter of finding the right rhythm? Is are you using a lot of power or what exactly would you say about your brush stroke? So my, uh, my power is set up very low. And, and the reason behind it is because when I'm tattooing, I'm creating layers and I want to make sure I do not break the skin. So it's very, it's running my, I run my machine very super slow, but sometimes when I do the line work, depending on the skin, I can put it just a little bit higher, you know, so I, I feel it's just a little bit more powerful, but even the brush strokes, I always do it in the low. So when I'm dragging the needle, everything stays in the skin. I don't, I don't feel like it's like, I'm not going too fast for it to like ink kind of stays in the skin. I'm actually doing it slow. And I know sometimes on the video or when I'm posting my tattoos, it looks like I'm just going for it and it looks super fast. Maybe my movement is fast, but the machine is running low, definitely. So there's a lot of layering to get that saturation. Yes, there is lots of layering. Somebody who has better skin, it's much easier. Of course, I can go just like three, four times, let's say into the same spot. But if somebody has a little bit more difficult skin to absorb ink, then in that case, I can even go there like 10 times. And no problem. I do not break the skin. So, yeah, let's go ahead and look at a, a couple of pieces up close. Um, let's pull up the first one. Oh, hang on. I'm trying to get this thumbnail mm -hmm. bigger on. Okay. Uh, 8014. What's up? Okay. So, for some reason, my stream is not keeping up. So, I'm just uh, 
I'm going to have to look at the small version here. Okay, so this is a little okay, bit okay. more. Okay. Uh, Ivana, can you see it? Do you have it up on your, oh, I mean, you know the piece. Uh, it would be very helpful if I could get it to show on my screen. Yeah, in fact, I'd like to uh, not talk about these photos until I can get them. You might try a refreshing the stream then, guy, but it's also yeah. a little bit behind. Okay. Well, let's then bring up the video, uh, Ivana Collect. We've got a, a, a few different uh, plain. tattoos close up. Okay, and, and also we've got uh, some inks that we're seeing here you want to talk a little bit about your ink preference um have we lost ivana no i'm here okay i hear you guys mm -hmm. yes so ivana let's hear about the inks that you use um mm -hmm. you're a cheyenne user what about your colors i'm exclusively using uh intense tattoo ink i'm using that for around i would say at least past 12 years. And that was one of one of my uh, things when my tattooing took up on a whole different level. I was just experimenting with inks and uh, then I kind of like intense ink. Somebody introduced me, my friend introduced me intense ink and they have they were coming up that year with lots of these, uh, I would say like pastel, pastel tones, like a sea foam green and aquamarine. And there was this like bubble gum pink and all of these colors. And I really love it. So I was tattooing my, my friend and I was just experimenting, kind of doing, I would say, watercolor tattoo, but I was just more playing with the inks. And I smack all of these pastel inks there and I was hooked up on it. And I was like, oh my God, this is exactly where my tattoos I'm going to take on in this di direction. And actually from that moment, that was where I started to develop my style. Super funky color. And later on, I started to add graphic designs to it more or graphic elements. But the initial, actually, why I started to do this also, or how I developed my, my particular colorful style, it was because of intense inks that one day when I played. Okay, well, that's, that's a, mm -hmm. a heck of a, uh, an endorsement uh, right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're using their black as well? Yes, I'm using everything from intense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, nice. they, have few, they have few, yes, they have uh, pretty much, yes, all different kinds of black, and there is this speci specially, uh, one line, I think it's a, uh, what is his name? Bowery, Bowery ink, and that is absolutely my favorite. With the white and the black, that's my two favorites from Intense. So it's just a little bit different line, the guy who created them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anything else that you use in your day-to-day -day setup besides your, okay, first of all, let's go back to your Cheyenne equipment. What is the machine? Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a Cheyenne user as well. I'm using a Sol Nova. Same. Uh, same, okay. Yes, I yeah. love Sol Nova. I was using all of them. Obviously, the the whole I was a bit shy since the beginning. They started, but now I'm using Sol Nova. They're going to send me the unlimited one soon, so I still have cables and everything. But Sol Nova is my favorite. I love the way it, uh, it sits in my hand. It's heavy enough for me, but at the same time, it's not like my hand is painful or something. It's just I really love it. It's perfect, and I love the punch how it's going to the skin. So you know, sometimes they have a few different machines for lining for making the lines, different machines for the shading, but I feel with Solnova I can do both. Yeah, yeah, it's, I've, mm. I've used the same machine for over two years. I yeah, have I love one it. Of the, I have the unlimited one. I use it every now and then uh, just to, to compare. I, I wanna try to get used to it, but it's a little bit different. The weight is different. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels uh, a little bit more hollow, I think, just because the machine body has some empty space in it that the, the corded one doesn't have. Uh, and plus, I'm just so used to having that cord after all these decades. I don't know. There's I, I, I'm, I'm excited to actually have this machine to try it out because I am over the cords. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? There's, I've heard of ghost cord syndrome. Like, you know, you're working cordless mm -hmm. and it's just like, so something's wrong here. Mm -hmm. But uh, for people who aren't in the old habits, I'm sure it's the best thing ever. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I don't want to deal with any cords in my life ever. <laughs> yeah well i mean it's it definitely puts the ink in just as well there's there's no mm -hmm. difference there i've, I've uh, seen the stuff heal that was done with both machines so yeah it's crazy you know all of a sudden we're cordless these are like sci-fi tattoo machines mm -hmm. so what else are you using in your daily setup that uh, you think is indispensable uh definitely um 
do you mean to talk about my all the equipment I use for my tattooing? Yeah, please. Okay. So I'm using my usually set up bits. Okay, we know about chain, we know about intense ink. Then I'm using uh, wipes out. You probably, I'm not sure whether you are familiar with that. It's uh, Mike Devries. He developed these uh, like a paper towels, but it's super, super small. It's nice for the traveling. But I love that because I noticed with my color tattoos, I use so many rolls of these uh, bounty paper towels. And with this wipe house, wipe out it's it's a uh, 10 sheets in one package and i use probably two maximum three for my color work so that's amazing that's definitely one of my uh, favorite stuff right now and then i'm using stencil forte for stencil i love that one because it's uh, antibacterial and at the same time it really holds nice my stencil so that's another one Hustle butter. Hustle butter is one of my absolutely favorites. I have one with the CBD now, CBD Lux. That's the newest one. And I love, love to use it for the skin because it takes away the redness. It calms the skin. And this one with the CBD one, it relaxes the muscle. So it's my number one right now. It's better than the, better than the regular one. Hush. So that's also my setup. And Hush. I think that's all what I have there. Uh, in cups. Hush. Hush. Are you yes. using anything for numbing people? Yes, I'm using Hush anesthetics, especially what is my favorite. I don't like to numb skin too much before tattoo, but when I'm, uh, when I'm in the process, during the process, I use Hush foam. So that's definitely one of my favorites. I, th I think For that I it's very similar to Bactine in terms of how strong it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've used both and th the results are pretty similar. I don't yeah. like to pre-numb people. Uh, that numbing ahead of time, I think it, you end up having a terrible session. Mm -hmm. uh, because people just aren't ready for the pain when it does come. Uh, if I'm going to pre-numb uh, part of the tattoo, it's going to be near the end of the session. Yeah. Like when I had my upper back and the back of my neck tattooed, I had a really hard time with the back of my neck. So mm -hmm. my artist, Don McDonald, worked on the upper back without any anesthetic except for Bactine. And then when we got to the neck, we numbed it ahead of time. Yeah. And I was able to sit for it. So there's a time and place for that. But I hate I it when people show up already wrapped and it's like, oh, bad Same. idea. Yes, I do not like it at all. And this is also what I tell my clients, please do not put anything there. Because I have all of these lines from harsh anesthetics. There is cases, of course, when I, when I uh, give it to people in some hard spots, like you say, you know, like back of your neck or maybe when I do the ribs or something, but only in few cases. And uh, yeah, so that's when it comes to harsh. Harsh form is my definitely favorite. Then I'm using hive cups. Hive cups is just, it's just cute. I love how it looks on the table. It's super colorful ink cups. So that's my favorite, I must say. And I like it because you, you can kind of like crack it. And I have, let's say 20, 20 ink cups or however I want, and it sticks together. So I don't have to separately kind of like have all of the separate ink cups. Very nice for the traveling also. And it looks good. I, I love all of the colors and it's in the shape of honeycombs. So that's very nice. Uh, all of the supplies, what I use also, I have from Killer Ink. So my, my mask and my gloves and everything, I'm using their tattoo supply. And another thing is for after tattooing, it's Dermalize Pro. I'm using Dermalize Pro also for the, for the past around three years or a couple of years, I would say. And I just, I just love to protect my tattoos. I also recommend to my clients how to take care of it and everything. But I feel with that because it's... It's clean, it's sterilized, people can take shower with it, the skin is breathing. So that, that's my another favorite right after I finish my tattoo. I recommend, so, I recommend people to take care of it this way. And after four days of using Dermalize Pro, I recommend Hustle Butter, just to keep it moist. Okay, so you've mentioned masks, uh, and that's an, a big subject right now. Have mm -hmm. you regularly been wearing masks while working before the COVID-19 crisis, or is this a new thing for you? It is not new thing. I, I was using masks before, but I must say I'm not using them like all the time. When I go, mostly when I go to conventions, I'm wearing masks or I don't know, with some clients, I wear the mask, but not all the time, I must say. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, brad like that. It's just easier yeah. for me to breathe with a mask and everything, you know? Yes. Uh, the mm -hmm. very last person that I tattooed before this this break uh i uh, worked with my face covered and i didn't have any masks so i just 
uh, folded a bandana in half and mm -hmm. wore that. And it was just strange. I, I figured, you know, I could do this if I have to. And it could be that there's a season that we have to wear masks and the rest yeah. of the year we don't have to. We'll see what happens. But and what you a know strange what? thing. For me, it's also about uh, depends on the body part, you know, like some body parts I do want to wear a mask. Like, I don't know, it's just for my even for my own protection or the client or maybe sometimes when I'm like really close to your face or something, I think it's not really enjoyable if two people breathe on each other, you know? Yes, yes. So in that case, I do prefer mask. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, that's a new thing. Masks are probably going to be standard equipment for all of us very soon. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's sort of in some ways it's sad, but you know this is the new world. We, we have to adapt. Yeah, but I but I think for even for our own protection, it's okay. You know, like it should be that way. I really think so. It's just we not get used to it, and we are not following the rules probably a hundred percent. But I think we should wear them anyway. We'll look back at the time before masks, mm. just like we look back at the time before gloves, and say, whoa. Yeah, I was tattooing without gloves when I started to tattoo. I didn't wow. know any better. Yeah, I know. <laughs> in the kitchen, like without gloves, the blood, everything. And I was washing my hands for half an hour <laughs> because I felt so dirty. At least you knew to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it might have been hard to get gloves too back then. Mm -hmm. Where exactly were you living at the time when you started? In Slovakia. I was, I was living and growing up in this little village. It was maybe 100 people there. That's all what is there. There's nothing. One church, crossroad. We don't have grocery store there now. We don't have liquor store. There's nothing. There's, you know, there is no pub. There is literally nothing. You have to have a car to access everything. But people wanted to get tattoos. <laughs> of course. <Yes. laughs> for, them, for them, it was something new. You know, like nobody, nobody had a tattoos there. So I started to make a tattoos on my brother. And then he asked, his friends saw it. So now everybody was coming into our house and I was just tattooing them in the kitchen. <laughs> So where, where did you go next when you left that town? I left from, I left to Australia. No, from, from my village, actually, I lived to town. So I was living in, the name of the town was Trenchin. I was living there for around one year. And that's, that's, I started to tattoo more. And I started to tattoo for money before I was just literally playing and learning. But this was like my proper job. And after one year, I left to Australia, to Sydney. Okay, and there you got to work on a lot of very um, sun damaged skin, and you were doing mm -hmm. this this bright color style. So that probably gave you a chance to to work on making it stronger. So in Australia, I was doing that time only black tattoos. Okay. I was tatt yes. So when I left from Slovakia, I was doing still for a few years in Australia only black tattoos because I knew only two needles, and that was three liner. Later on, I added fourteen round. That was for my shading. And that's all what I knew and the black ink. The studio I was at the time in Australia, it wasn't like super progressed, I would say, you know. Oh, by the way, my boss was your big fan. That's how I knew you because every day, uh, Guy Edison book was Bible <laughs> in our studio, but not, not even in our studio. It was like you were a big thing in Australia at that time. So he introduced me to you, you know. That was fun. That's how I knew you, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. And anyway, like, that's so slowly later on, I was uh, going for, I started to go for tattoo conventions and I saw Joe Capobianco. It was convention in Melbourne and I was tattooing for that time, maybe like five or seven years already. Five years, I would say. And I was asking him like, oh my God, like how do you do all of that color and what needles do you use? Because that was, that was probably the first time I saw magnums. And he told me, it's like, oh yeah, like you have to use the magnum. So he just showed me the needles and uh, then I was so pumped. I came back to studio and I bought everything. I ordered from US uh, these needles. I, I ordered uh, new inks and everything. And I started to experiment with color. Okay. Yeah. And then that led to what mm -hmm. we see now. Mm -hmm. Did you end up on the West Coast first when you came to uh, the United States? Yes. When I came to United States, actually Gabe from Tattoo Now, uh, from East Hampton. So he invited me to do the guest spot. From, from Sydney, I flew here, so I was in US for some time doing guest spots, and then I started to travel a little bit around, moved back to Australia, then I was living in New Zealand for some time, Caribbean, and then I made final decision, okay, I want to live in US, and I came to, to California. Well, especially if you're used to the Caribbean, I guess that would make mm -hmm. sense. 
Yeah. But but you've worked on plenty of sun damaged skin and mm-hmm. and uh so what would be some recommendations you'd make for very brightly colored tattoos that hold up in sun damage and that kind of thing that that are good with aging? I always recommend, and I do that in my tattoos, I put lots of black. I know my work looks super colorful, but there is lots of black. And the one uh, one thing I also learned (laughs) with this kind of skin is you have, or I prefer to do the black lines. So I will show you again. I'll show you on my on my phone something. I will explain to you the process how I do it. I always frame my tattoos. So do you see this? I make a kind of sketch. Yeah. Sketch, okay, just the lines. Then I take really like needles. Like usually I love to use three liner for the sketch, five liner to really make black lines because not necessarily everything and especially inside the tattoos, I want to have a line. So I make a blood lines, okay? I, di- I diluted ink or just use the water. I make a blood lines and then I will work inside. But this is pretty much like a shell. So everything what is around that shell, I will frame with the black ink, you see? Mm, yep. Yes. So once I have this, these lines, then I, if I want to make them thicker, usually this is always a five liner. If I want to make them thicker, I take literally five magnum or nine magnum, and then whatever parts I want to have a thicker, I will do it with the magnum. So this already has a strong dynamic for me. It's almost like a street art, you know? So it's, it has that strong frame, strong dynamic, and then I started to work on my black. And I put lots of black in my tattoos. I can show you, I will show you this picture now. Do you see this is my second step? This is all the black I put. Any chance you could zoom in on the photo? Uh, actually, yeah. Um, exactly. Oh, that looks great. Yeah, we can see that very clearly. Okay. So is any of that wash or is that just moving black very quickly? Wash, yes. I always do wash. Mm-hmm. And the, the I do a little bit wash differently. I'm not mixing my black with the glycerin or using this 30% wash, 50% wash or anything like that. Basically, I just dip it. You know, I, I have a, I use gray ink or, or silver gray. Then I have, of course, uh, black ink and um, white ink. And I kind of mix all of this together with a little bit of glycerin. And I kind of like just mix it up uh, without any like percentage or I'm not measuring it. It's just by the feel, how it feels. But I, I mix, I mix these four together. So black ink, let's say silver gray or gray or whatever you use, white and then the glycerin. So the silver gray that you're talking about, this is an opaque gray. Is it about medium or a little darker? Would you say 50 or 60%? I, I prefer I, I prefer that probably like 50%. Like it, it looks kind of like gray. It's a little bit darker gray, actually. That would be my favorite. Not the super light gray, but the dark gray. Or if, or sometimes you can use, uh, even though if you use light gray, you know, and then I mix it up with the black, but it's around 50-50, I would say. And uh, the reason behind it is probably because I'm not doing the typical black and gray, I, you know, these washes and stuff like that. But with this kind of mixing the gray and the white, it has kind of plasticky look. And, and that plasticky look, it's uh, definitely my style. That's like a part of, part of, part of the style I do. It's just very saturated, and that's one of the reasons mm-hmm. why you uh, are doing two healed passes on people. Yes, and sometimes it's very soft, but when it heals, it's not that typical black and gray. You can still see it's, it's just a little bit different. I, I call it plasticky look. I don't know how to exactly explain. Well, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. some people have even said that uh, that very saturated, bright color scheme is like plastic or candy. You know, that's another... Mm-hmm. That, description that I've heard and uh, I'm looking at a photo of your palette here and I see you do a lot of dipping back and forth yes uh, between your colors this is what I was uh, this is what I was saying I don't have any plans I just kind of mix up color like when you do the painting I dip 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 and then then when I think it's kind of like desire ink or desire tone of the ink I want to use then I put it on the skin is this a good time for the uh, fox video yeah, let's let's put that on. There's a lot of dipping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of dipping in. <laughs> okay, so yeah. A lot of di- dip, di- dip, dipping and splashing, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's a very 
painter's kind of approach to coloring and being uh, mm -hmm. having the freedom to jump back and forth between your ink caps like that. Uh, I think some yeah, people are a little a little nervous about that. They don't know if they know enough color theory to uh, be able to just have that freedom. So what would what would you recommend to get over that nervousness? Like how much color theory do you really need to know? Okay, I don't know any color theory. To be honest, I never study. But I, for me, it's everything about aesthetic feel. And people have to a little bit experiment. When I was experimenting in the beginning, I also didn't know like what works or what's not. But I feel very free when, I'm, when I tattoo, very free. And again, the first session, even though if you, okay, maybe you can mess up something or something doesn't work out the way you want, you still see your client after two, three months, and you can fix it. So that's another thing. I, I would recommend that to people because you learn so much by doing two sessions. You know, sometimes I even changing my colors, not entirely, but I can definitely change colors from the first session to second session. And I think especially, that... Especially the lighter tones, it's absolutely not a problem. I can have completely different feel of the tattoo after second session compared to first one. Right, because you can just mm -hmm. layer the colors and they'll settle together into something that looks like it was planned. Yes. And another thing is also, this is just a little trick. It's not even trick, it's, but what I do. So when I tattoo and I dip colors so much, I really like to fill up my ink cups properly. They always have to be full. And if I use, I don't even go to the half. Half is already like kind of like I have to fill it up again. Because when I dipping again, it's diluted with the blood and I want to have a really high saturation of ink. So I just keep pouring my ink. So I love to have my, cu my ink cups full. Okay. Or, if you, or if you see, I have, let's say, 20 ink cups, but five of them, it's exactly the same color. So in, in the process, I don't want to take any break and, you know, pour, pour the ink. So I put five ink cups. And when I'm getting too close to a little bit like a half cup, I dip onto the another one because that one is still full. You know? Yeah. yeah. So the ink is still rich. I love to do that. Right. Well, I do that also. If there's yes. a particular mm -hmm. color that I know I'm going to be using more of, I always mm -hmm. have two blacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them I'll abandon after a while because I know it's it got some rinse water and blood in it. And I want to have a pure mm -hmm. black. So yes. I, I see you're I, doing something similar. Yes, so always have kind of like a full cups, you know, because like I said, you will have a, high, a higher saturation of the ink going to the skin. I just think it's better. And when you asked me uh, before about the damaged skin, so this would be the first step. It's put lots of black and I'm framing my tattoos. And the rest kind of like, again, I'm starting to work with the darker colors first and then I go to the light. When I finish it, I let it settle a little bit. Then I put the hush foam because the skin is a little bit, you know, irritating and it can be a little bit painful. And then I'm darkening up some spots again. With some skin, it's a little bit easier to do. And I'm not basically going to like, let's say if I have a yellow there, bright yellow, or I have some white ink there, and then I want to do the black again. Sometimes you can kind of like smudge it, you know. But in some, some cases in the skin, it's completely perfect. Or I, or I put hustle butter on it. So basically it doesn't absorb any other ink. And I can still darken up. I can go back to my tattoo and darken up some spots towards the end. Yeah, uh, I think it's mm -hmm. important to be able to do that. And and when yes. you're when mm -hmm. you're too worried about oh I have to do all my black in the very beginning of the session, uh, sometimes you'll see things towards the end where man exactly. that really needs to be darker. It could benefit from more black, but man, mm -hmm. there's yellow right next to it. So yeah, you put, put plenty yeah, of put hustle butter or vaseline. Hustle butter, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, then you blot gently before you wipe. Yes. And then and, you wipe uh, away from it. Yes. And another thing is I'm very, uh, I would say, I, I like the details in my tattoos or I'm, I'm kind of like perfectionist. So another thing, what I always do towards the end of the session, obviously like I'm staring at the tattoo, let's say for, for five hours straight. And my, my, my vision can be a little bit different. So I take a photo, I, I pull out my camera and I take a photo on my camera and I can see straight away what it needs. Straight away, it's just different perception, what gives me, but I, I tend to do that with all of my tattoos. So towards when I kind of feel like, okay, the tattoo, I would say like, it's done. Then I pull out my camera, I take a photos, but even though one photo is sometimes enough for me, it's just different perception. I look at the photo and I'm like, oh, this is exactly what it needs. This, is, this needs more detail, this needs more shading, this needs more black or whatever. And then again, I take photo and when I'm happy with that, that's when I call it, call it a day. That's, that's done for me. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's a, kind of a nice way of reviewing it and making mm-hmm. sure that you're you're getting a better because otherwise you're taking a photo of it as they're leaving and you're looking at it after they're already gone and saying Man, exactly. I wish I and yeah. this is a, this is exactly why I started doing that because I was just taking photos and then I'm like, dang, like sometimes literally I even forgot to put something that what I wanted and I didn't, or you know, we, it, it, I knew I could do it better. So I always take a photos and when I'm happy with the photo, then I then I call it, then I call it a day like it's done. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I also like to. You mm-hmm. know, I'm, t- I'm doing six hour sessions usually, so I take a break yeah, for three hours, mm-hmm. and when I take my break, uh, I'll take a photo of it. And while I'm mm-hmm. eating, I'll, I'll look at it. And sometimes I'll see things that, you know, I'll want to strengthen. To, you know, I'm, I'm halfway done at that point. But I also, mm-hmm. since I freehand most things, before I start, I usually take a quick coffee and snack break. I'll photograph it then. Mm-hmm. And I almost always change something when I sit back down because it's only marked at that point. Yeah. Always. Yes. So that's exactly what I do. Or I, I like to see clients from distance. So this is another thing. I say, okay, go like five steps, <laughs> you know, go five step, steps apart from me because I want to see it from the distance, how it looks like. Even stencil, I want to see everything from distance. I think, I think it's very important to have all different looks, you know, from the close-up, the picture on the camera you see, then obviously when you see the client and the, the distance picture. All, all of this kind of perception I need to have there. And, and then I kind of decide like, okay, like that's good or... It needs a little bit more. I need to balance a little bit this part. So when I do these uh, squiggles or the background stuff, that's part of it, you know? I see clients from the stance and I'm looking at his body part and I feel like, okay, like maybe this side is a little bit more overpowering or maybe it's kind of like, I, I feel there is more stuff, let's say on the left-hand side. So then I take a pen, I make some freehand on the other side, but optically when you look at it, it, it balances. Mm. Do you do that with color also? Do you sometimes look at it when it's most of the way finished and realize, oh, it, it needs some more yellow over here? For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Always I do this. So I have like a few different steps <laughs> where when I decided like, okay, I'm done for today because my tattoos are, or even yours, you know, it's like a painting. You can always go there, but then you reach this point when you decide like, okay, like that's done. Done for today, you know? So even though you say you have no uh, color theory, like if I were to just talk in the most basic kind of terms, it seems like you have a really good knack for uh, separating your warmer colors and your cooler colors. Like you've got big shapes that contrast each other very strongly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gabe, let's put up the, uh, there's a, let's see, 90B88B. That's a really good example. And you've got very uh, strongly separated color there. Now, without any theory, are you at least thinking in terms of cool and warm or what are you're just contrasting everything as, as much as, as you can or? No, I will tell you exactly what I have no plan beforehand. I love to meet my client and the, the energy of the person. What I, what I feel, everybody is giving me giving off different energy. So some people I see straight away red, let's say, or warm tones. Some people I see cold tones. And that's what I make my decision. What tattoo I'm going to create with what tones? Is it going to be the red tones or is it going to be the cold tones? So it's literally, it's, I'm basing off this only from the energy of my particular client. I have no plan before. And even though if I think I want to do the red tones, but I see the client, I, I do not feel that way. I'm not going to do it. Because I love when when I feel the tattoo is absolutely suitable for individual. So that that means you want to be able to make changes to your plan. Be flexible. Absolutely, yes. I ha- I want to be flexible, and depends of also of the skin. Like we talked about earlier, somebody has super pale skin, somebody has a little bit like darker skin or whatever. So that's also um, what helps my decision with the colors. If somebody has darker skin, I don't really want to use too, too much of yellow because I don't think so. It's just going to look nice, you know? So I'm, I'm using then a little bit like darker tones, I would say, or something. But when it heals, it's still going to look nice. Do you uh, use more open skin uh, on people with darker skin tones? What do you mean open skin? Uh, untattooed areas. I always prefer untattooed areas. Okay, okay. <laughs> always prefer that, yeah. Yeah, I see For, that a lot of that, just even in the mm-hmm. examples behind you, uh, in mm-hmm. your studio, those are uh, all pieces that are 
probably at least 20% uh, empty skin. Yes, I really prefer it because I feel the tattoos are a little bit like so different compared to, let's say if my client is tattooed already, and I feel if I smack my tattoo, that is just really different. Like it doesn't even match. It doesn't have to match, but it just doesn't. So I always uh, ask like, oh, like, or I'm choosing the area if, if they're flexible enough. I must have amazing clients. So they really let me do whatever. They let me even the choose areas on their body. They basically just kind of tattoo collectors and they want to have my piece of artwork. So in that sense, it's amazing because of course, I always pick the area where there's nothing. So whether it's leg, whether it's thigh, whether it's arm, but I do prefer it. So I have nothing in the way. I am not limited with the space. And my two favorite areas is forearm and the thigh. Thigh is my absolute favorite because I think it's large enough for me to create some nice piece. And usually the skin is not damaged there too. So that's probably my favorite area to tattoo on the body. Okay. Well, is there anything else that you would like to say about your tattoo process uh, before we uh, talk about our exercise that, that we're going to be doing later? Maybe I would like to add just, just now uh, thinking of it is uh, the actual picture versus background, because I notice lots of people sometimes overpower the main design with the background. So I think that should be taken in consideration or sometimes people want to, you know, smack these graphic elements into the design, but they put too much. So it, again, for me, it kind of like kills the main design. I think it should be uh, gently placed wherever it needs to be, you know? That would be something I would, I would recommend to people to be a little bit careful because the most important is like, let's say this owl, what you see here, it's the owl should be the most important and then just a little bit something around, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah well i mean that it's it's tempting to try to make the most of every square inch of skin i think that i know but sometimes sometimes it's not important do you see this do you see this when i'm putting finger look at this uh where is it this one yes do you see this uh, that empty. one there yes yeah. yes okay so this empty area this is my absolutely favorite you don't need to use skin in every uh, you know, inch and color, everything you don't need to. I love actually this uh, empty space here. I love it. I think it actually takes courage to do that. Uh, and, it, and it's harder. It's harder yes. because you need to be like really sure like where you're going to put it and it still looks good, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, and you don't want that person's friends to say, well, when are you going to get that finished every time they look at their tattoo? It, <laughs> it needs to, to be obvious that it is a finished piece of art, even yeah. though it has the, these very, you know, understated areas mm -hmm. in it. And I think that maybe that's one of the things that's so successful about your style is it is designed in such a way that that is obvious. Mm -hmm. And then also I would love to uh, recommend people to definitely experiment more because that's how you learn, you know? So just go for it. Like sometimes there is too many rules. This is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. But I think... Uh, people should obviously listen to it to a certain extent, but I still feel people should have a little bit more freedom when creating tattoos. Agreed. Well, that's a, that's a great last thing to say before we walk into mm -hmm. our, uh, our exercise. So mm -hmm. we were hoping that some of you will join us. So yes, anybody that wants to sign up for this, uh, uh, Ivana and I will join you for uh, this interactive drawing group and we'll have an assignment for you. It is going to have something to do with the, uh, the goals that we talked about today, uh, simplifying, uh, making good use of background uh, to, uh, you know, make sure your foreground is, is stronger uh, by not doing too much in the background, having uh, a personal interpretation of a photo that is a nice stylization. We're going to touch on all these things, but we'll have the specifics of, you, of it for you when, uh, when you sign up later. Um, there is a link on the same page as this video, or you can find it at tattooeducation.com forward slash video hyphen on hyphen demand. Um, and we're hoping you can join us later on. And Ivana, thank you. This has been a great talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for watching. Yeah, I wanted to say that we had people from, let's see, the United States, the UK, Colombia, Canada, Australia, India, Very Poland, nice. Germany. Nice. 
That's awesome. Amazing. Outstanding. <laughs> I'm glad we can inspire the world. I'm glad that the world can come join us here. This is so cool. <laughs>